Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to the AZ Bio organizers for the opportunity, and thank uh, thank you to the audience for uh, spending the time and being here today. So we're going to give you an overview of our 15 years of impact. This is me. Uh, I've been with CPATH uh, since the organization was two years old. Uh, I've seen the growth of the organization, and, and I've played several different roles, and now I'm the, the chief science officer. So it's a it's an honor to play that role, and it's an honor to be here. So let's start with the with the beginning. So this is where where we came from. And so if you if you think of of uh, CPATH, you have to think of the Critical Path Initiative. And the Critical Path Initiative uh, is is that this is an FDA effort uh, that started with this white paper published in two thousand four. Um, and so this white paper essentially was a call to action uh, to transform fundamentally the drug development process through collaborations. And uh, we, the Critical Path Institute, were incorporated in 2005 uh, to help FDA realize the vision uh, for in the Critical Path Initiative. So uh, that's why uh, we have the name we have. Uh, and uh, as you can see in the slide background, uh, we're celebrating 15 years of existence uh, and impact. And so uh, one question that we get is, okay, so if you work so closely with the FDA and if you were created uh, in order to respond and help FDA realize the vision of the Critical Path Initiative, why are you in Tucson? Well, uh, this all starts with Ray Woosley, our founder, uh, he's the one who recruited me to join the organization. He's the one who infected me with his vision. Uh, he started his career uh, in industry uh, a while ago in, in the golden era of antiarrhythmic drug developments in, in the early 80s. And uh, as soon as he started uh, his career in, in pharma, he recognized that the process was inefficient. And uh, he always wanted to uh, have a, a forum where uh, drug companies could uh, meet up and uh, share information, not on the products, not, not anything that would be problematic, but just think through the process and how the process could be optimized. That didn't take at the time. He then went to academia, which is an interesting move. It's usually the, the other way around. But he went to Vanderbilt, and there he made significant contributions to the fields of pharmacogenomics and pharmacometrics. He kept the idea of, of making his uh, forum happen, but that didn't take at Vanderbilt. And uh, then he got an offer from Georgetown. He went to Georgetown much closer to the FDA. He established a lot of connections with the agency uh, back then, and he uh, created a, a, a world-class clinic pharmacology group uh, in Georgetown in those days. Uh, and then uh, an offer came to come to the U of A to be the Dean of the College of Medicine and be, be Vice President of Research. And so he took that option and uh, moved to Tucson. Uh, and in 2004, the Critical Path Initiative from FDA um, was published and he immediately recognized the opportunity. So uh, we we were founded in 2004 within the U of A and then we were incorporated in 2005. So we are a program from the from the U of A. Um, we kept growing, we kept uh, transforming the drug development process in uh, 2013 after Ray's retirement, Martha Brumfield took the reins and uh, she helped us really solidify our, our global presence with first an office in London and now an office in Dublin. Um, and uh, since April, of 2019, uh, we are under the visionary leadership of Joseph Sharon, who has helped us uh, pretty much double our our uh, revenue and uh, double our impact in the midst of a of a pandemic. And okay, so that's what we're in Tucson. But then, if you ask, okay, what is it that you guys really do? And so, if you think about it, we we do three things with one object. So we generate the legal infrastructure, we generate the scientific infrastructure, and we generate uh, the regulatory infrastructure to be able to provide this uh, neutral ground so that companies that need to remain competitors outside 
can come to this neutral ground that we provide and uh, together with the regulators, other government agencies, the patient groups and uh, academia can uh, collaborate and share information that they would not be able to share otherwise. A lot of times that information comes in the form of the patient level data from the industry trials, the observational studies from academia and the patient registries from the patient groups. And we take that information, we transform that information into actionable knowledge for uh, drug development. And uh, we put those solutions through formal regulatory review pathways at the FDA and EMA to generate the necessary confidence for their ado adoption. And that's how we transform the drug development process. So um, this is not an extensive, exhaustive timeline of everything that, that we've done, but uh, we started with the first public-private partnership uh, that was focused on, on uh, predictive safety. That's the predictive safety testing consortium. That was our first indication agnostic. Um, and then uh, in 2010, we, start, we continued with the uh, indication agnostic theme with the creation of the patient report outcomes consortium. But we started also um, focusing on very challenging and very specific therapeutic areas. So uh, indication specific efforts. And each one of the efforts that we started in each one of those areas learned from the previous one. Uh, so integration of knowledge is a key component of what we do. And now we're back to indication agnostic efforts like uh, the rare disease uh, cures accelerator data analytics platform that deals with uh, any and all rare diseases and uh, the cure drug repurposing collaboratory that deals with uh, any infectious disease and some oncology indications at least to begin with. So in terms of the, the actual programs that we have active, these are the ones. And so as you can see, there's uh, some that are indication specific or others that are indication agnostic, but the common denominator, the foundation of every single one of these efforts is collaboration. And so in terms of uh, collaboration, uh, we have uh, partnerships with more than 80 uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. Uh, more than 34 nonprofit organizations, more than 11 government agencies, and that includes the regulatory agencies, and uh, more than 20 universities with more than 1,600 scientists collaborating with us on a daily basis. And so uh, with that in mind, the, um, the information that, that uh, we gather, as, as we shared before, uh, where we take the, the patient level data and the experimental level data uh, has grown, as you can see in this graph, uh, to being close to 140,000 subjects from 156 different uh, data sources, uh, from clinical trials to observational studies to registries, um, and uh, 163 preclinical studies with uh, just over 11,000 subjects. So the, the animal uh, uh, data sets that we integrate. And in tuberculosis, we have uh, over 9,000 uh, isolates from the pathogen. So that's, that's a pretty unique uh, integration of data. So we work uh, in the field of big data even before that was a, that was a buzzword. Uh, but then the question, and so that's great, that provides us the foundation to generate the solutions that we are known for. But then one question that comes to mind when you see these numbers of, of data sources is how can you possibly make sense of all those different data sets? And so we have to use standards. And uh, the kinds of standards that we use are, are CETA standards. And so we've had to either directly or in partnership, develop therapeutic area specific standards so that we can make sense of those uh, data sets that we integrate. Now, one advantage that these uh, CDS standards have is that they themselves are a resource for industry because after December of 2017, every single clinical data point submitted to uh, the FDA for the evaluation of the efficacy and safety of drugs needs to be submitted in CDISC form. So the standards themselves are a resource for our partners in industry. And uh, that's what allows us to uh, really have all the data sets speak the same language, so to speak. But in addition, 
addition to all that, uh, we want to create added value. And when we get the permission from the contributors to do so, we make the integrated databases available to qualified researchers um, outside of, of CPATH and outside of the collaborations we run. And uh, in, in that uh, vein, we have seven databases that uh, represent just over 28,000 uh, subjects and uh, uh, over 9,000 uh, TB isolates uh, from the pathogen. Across all these data sets, uh, three in tuberculosis, like I said, one with the isolates, two with uh, clinical trial data, uh, but also uh, data sets in Friedrich's ataxia, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, and polycystic kidney disease. So that's a great added value. Zooming into the Alzheimer's database example, this one uh, database that we can make available to qualified researchers through the Critical Path for Alzheimer's Disease Consortium, uh, has 41 uh, studies that represent more than 20,000 subjects. So that's the, the that's the biggest one that we can make available. And it's uh, glo uh, globally accessible. Um, currently actively interacting with the data as we speak from more than 700 organizations in uh, 47 countries. So that's, uh, that's a great testament to that added value that we provide. But again, we're not a lender um, and that's not our, our main mission. Our main mission is to uh, do this, generate those actionable solutions uh, in, in the case of uh, RDCA in rare diseases, but uh, if it's not a rare disease, we generate those solutions nonetheless. And how can we make that happen? We make that happen because we have the luxury of a data collaboration center and we have the luxury of the quantitative medicine program, which is the one that I helped create. And so the data collaboration center provides us the, the infrastructure and the procedures to be able to integrate all the different data sources that we're able to integrate with the, the legal infrastructure to make that happen. And then the data science infrastructure to be able to curate and standardize those data. And uh, after we have the data speaking the same language, uh, that's when our partnerships between QuantMed and different consortia and the, and the external researchers uh, to generate the solutions that we are known for. And so a lot of times these solutions take the, take the form of clinical trial simulators where you're able to uh, integrate the information quantitatively speaking from disease progression, drug effects, placebo effects, uh, and dropouts and, and combine them in such a way that you can really truly optimize the design of clinical trials. I'll expand on this uh, notion in a little bit. But in addition, uh, we're working on uh, expanding the usability of our interfaces. And so we were thinking of three levels of interface, one that allows uh, a much better orientation as to what kinds of uh, variables are in the different data sets. Another one that allows the researcher to generate their own uh, analysis subsets. And then a third one, very sophisticated one, uh, that allows very sophisticated analyses to happen uh, within the, the data platform without the need to extract the data outside. So with, with that, I'm, I'm going to um, share with you some examples of, of tangible impact over our 15 years of existence. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start with examples of impact in model informed drug development. So there's gonna be a webinar run by uh, Jackson on Thursday of uh, this week. And uh, I'll, I encourage you to catch that uh, webinar. And so in tuberculosis, we developed a collection of quantitative solutions from uh, preclinical to translational to clinical trial quantitative models uh, that really helped uh, catalyze the first approval for the first new drug against tuberculosis in uh, about 50 years. And that was uh, bedaquiline. And then after bedaquiline came pertominant, and then after that came linezolid, and then the combination of those drugs. Um, so really that transformed an area where there was nothing into an area where there were uh, three major approvals and a solid pipeline of more than 20 drugs currently under development. In Alzheimer's disease, we developed a couple of, uh, of uh, very sophisticated quantitative tools uh, that can help researchers optimize the design of trials 
uh, evaluate, that are going to evaluate the efficacy and safety of drugs intended to be used before the diagnosis of dementia, as well as after the diagnosis of dementia. I'm going to expand on these a little bit. Uh, and then in polycystic kidney disease, uh, we generated uh, a joint model that looks at biomarker dynamics with disease progression. And that model uh, essentially facilitated uh, a series of, of regulatory uh, endorsements for these tools, but also, and more importantly, it facilitated the first ever uh, approval of uh, a treatment to uh, delay the, the disease progression in PKD. And uh, that was told Apton. And uh, that really sparked the, the interest in, in PKD drug development. And now there's a robust pop pipeline of over 10 drugs under development. So this is, this is uh, very uh, impactful work that, that we have generated through collaborations. And that's where the, where the power of, of collaboration and data sharing comes into fruition. Okay, in the field of biomarkers, I'm going to give you three examples. As you know, our first uh, success story was the qualification of seven uh, preclinical kidney safety biomarkers. But more importantly, recently, we uh, received the regulatory endorsement of uh, a composite measure that, that uh, has been optimized for uh, dose selection in clinical trials. And so this is, this is really impactful because this allows uh, sponsors to optimize the dose uh, to protect the kidneys of, of patients uh, with life-saving drugs under development. In Parkinson's disease, uh, we generate the, the necessary evidence uh, for sponsors to be able to understand how to optimize the use of an imaging marker uh, to optimize patient selection for trials in the early motor stages of uh, the disease. And, and those trials are ongoing as we speak. And in type 1 diabetes, we generate the, 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 the evidence that uh, allows sponsors to understand how to use uh, biomarkers in the form of autoantibodies um, to optimize the selection of patients for type 1 diabetes prevention trials. And so let me, let me emphasize that. This is type 1 diabetes prevention, so preventing the autoimmune damage uh, to the pancreas. And so these trials have yielded the, the first breakthrough designation um, for teplizumab, the, the first drug uh, approved to delay the onset of T1D. So this is uh, a pretty cool testament of our impact in, in uh, drug development through biomarkers. And then in outcomes research, patient reported outcome instruments, uh, we also have a number of impact stories in asthma, uh, the COA program at, uh, at CPATH through the PRO consortium developed a series of novel diaries uh, that allow patients to report their symptoms, and uh, that can be used as a, as a primary endpoint in clinical trials. And in non-small cell lung cancer, uh, they also developed uh, a novel questionnaire that, again, allows patients to report their symptoms, and that can be used as a primary endpoint, and the same in uh, major depression. And uh, as stated, the trials are ongoing, and uh, again, that's a testament of, of uh, pretty impactful work through collaboration. Um, so let me let me give you a little bit of a of a deeper dive, and there's going to be uh, another webinar on the 17th. So so catch that one by by Jackson Burton. Uh, but let me just give you a, a tangible example of what you can do with uh, clinical trial simulators. And this is an example with our free dementia trial simulator. Uh, this is a realistic scenario, um, an actual scenario of a company uh, trying to design a study to evaluate the efficacy and the safety of a therapeutic candidate uh, in, to prevent uh, the onset of dementia. So um, the challenge is that those trials are quite expensive. And so the, the company realistically had, had uh, res restricted uh, realistic budget of, of being able to recruit 200 patients for the trial. And so what happens is that if you just run the trials that everybody else runs, so um, this is, uh, you guys in industry will know that uh, there's a tendency to replicate what the competitors are doing. So in this case, if this company were to do that, you can see that the trial is going to fail and there's not going to be a demonstration of efficacy at the end of the study. But with the power of being able to quantitatively understand disease progression, drug effects, placebo effect, and dropouts and how the biomarkers play into the design of the clinical trials, 
the company is able to say, okay, so what happens if we optimize our frequency of visits? What happens if we optimize our selection criteria based on demographics? What happens if we optimize our selection criteria based on baseline severity for the subjects we want to recruit? What happens if we also optimize our patient selection based on uh, a genetic marker, the APOE4 uh, gene carrier status? What happens if we also optimize our patient selection strategy based on an imaging marker and we include patients that have a more solid evidence of hippocampal atrophy? Well, in that case, we can keep the uh, sample size at 200 and we would have a winning trial. And that's all great. And that's, like I said, a, a realistic example of, of work happening within the Alzheimer's Consortium. But this is all assuming that your dropout uh, scenario is going to be uh, as expected as per the design and the characteristics of the subjects at baseline. However, we're in the midst of a very interesting time with COVID, a pandemic that is affecting the ability of patients to be able to comply with clinical visits, and that in turn translates into uh, dropouts, an increased number of dropouts in the trials uh, that are being run. And so you can keep the, the simulation the same, but if you increase the dropout burden, uh, you can understand uh, what level of dropout burden actually uh, kills the trial. And that's, this is an example of ongoing work uh, that we're doing uh, at the request of members for CPAT and at the request of the FDA to help everyone understand what their trials can take in terms of uh, dropouts uh, before the integrity of those ongoing trials gets compromised. So again, proactive contribution uh, to mitigate the impact of the, on the, of the pandemic on drug development. Continuing on that thread, uh, and the, there's going to be a webinar uh, on the 16th by Mark Oskido. I recommend that you catch that. So uh, let me walk you through the Cure ID app. And if you have a chance to uh, check it out, I encourage you to do so. This is an application that was developed jointly by the FDA and NCATS as a non-intrusive way for clinicians in the trenches to report their real-world data experience with treating patients in need, mostly with off-label drug use in infectious diseases. And so this provides a treasure trove of data, of real-world data, without the complication of, of personal health information and protected health information uh, that can be leveraged to um, gain insights. And so around this app, we recently launched the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory. Like I said, there's going to be a webinar uh, where the details are going to be uh, discussed. But essentially what we want to do is transform this uh, real world data into real world evidence through uh, advanced analytics and artificial intelligence into hypotheses and signals that can then be used to optimize uh, trials to do drug repurposing efforts in infectious diseases. And of course, we have a COVID-19 pilot. And we're also thinking of a pilot for that effort in Valley Fever, which is an important disease for Arizona. And uh, our electronic PRO consortium uh, proactively generated three uh, best practice documents to minimize the impact of the pandemic on trials that are incorporating uh, patient reported outcome measures. Uh, so this one uh, is, is intended to uh, inform how to maximize electronic data capture. Uh, this one is intended to uh, inform how to um, implement response scales uh, for uh, PRO measures in clinical trials. And this one uh, illustrates how to migrate existing data collection modalities uh, into other modes, meaning electronic uh, to help also mitigate the impact of the pandemic on data collection in ongoing trials. And so with that, that that's uh, the, the summary of the impact that I wanted to share with you. Uh, but then what does the future look like? So in the, in the next five years, what we are focusing on doing is uh, solidifying our collaborations and build new collaborations 
to continue to put Arizona on the map, on the map uh, as a as a powerhouse in the biotech uh, zine. And then uh, we also want to uh, strengthen uh, our impact in in uh, optimizing and transforming uh, medical product developments. Uh, and we also want to continue to be a beacon for uh, global and diverse talent uh, to join us and uh, contribute to uh, drug development, medical product development, and contribute to uh, the growth of uh, the state uh, in economic terms. So in summary, uh, we are a global organization uh, deeply rooted in the Tucson community, and we continue to uh, plan to be that way. And uh, we are an organization that uh, uh, coordinates and runs collaborations, collaborations with many different groups and uh, many different individuals. And that includes a unique uh, relationship with the with international regulatory agencies. And uh, we want to continue to transform the medical product development process as per the from the critical path initiative document back in 2004, which is the reason why we were created in the first place. So with that, I'll uh, thank you for uh, listening and uh, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks.